interesting story on top of all of that. So I have one to share with you this evening, and it's taken from the Old Testament, 2 Kings 5, 1 to 14. 2 Kings 5, 1 to 14. The king of Aram had great admiration for Naaman, the commander of his army, because through him the Lord had given Aram great victory. But though Naaman was a mighty warrior, he suffered from leprosy. At this time, Aramean raiders had invaded the land of Israel, and among their captives was a young girl who had been given to Naaman's wife as a maid. One day the girl said to her mistress, I wish my master would go to see the prophet in Samaria. He would heal him of his leprosy. So Naaman told the king, what the young girl from Israel had said. Go and visit the prophet, the king of Aram told him. I will send him a letter of introduction for you to take to the king of Israel. So Naaman started out carrying as gifts 700 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. The letter to the king of Israel said, with this letter, I present my servant, servant Naaman. I want you to heal him of his leprosy. When king, the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes in dismay and said, Am I God that I can give life and take it away? Why is this man asking me to heal someone with leprosy? I can see that he's just trying to pick a fight with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, clothes in dismay, he sent his messenger to him. Why are you so upset? Send Naaman to me, and he will learn that there is a true prophet here in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and waited at the door of Elisha's house. But Elisha sent a messenger out to him with this message. Go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River. Then your skin will be restored and you will be healed of your leprosy. But Naaman became angry and stopped away. I thought he would certainly come out to me, he said. I expected him to wave his hand over the leprosy and call on the name of the Lord his God and heal me. Aren't the rivers of Damascus, the Abana and the Pafar better than any of the rivers of Israel? Why shouldn't I wash in them and be healed? So Naaman turned away and went in a rage. But his officers tried to reason with him. Sir, if the prophet had told you to do something very difficult, wouldn't you have done it? So you should certainly obey him when he simply says, go and wash and be cured. So Naaman went down to the Jordan River and dipped himself seven times as the man of God had instructed him. And his skin became as healthy as the skin of a young child, and he was healed. There are certainly modern elements in this story. And perhaps if you listen to the psalm I read earlier, Psalm 52, there was the warrior part in that as well. So you might want to compare that later on. Here's an army officer. He's won great victories for his king, and he is valued because of his accomplishments. And we, we see this in our daily news. Updates from army officers fighting to win some military victories. I think we've seen more army officers and army guns and tanks and stuff than we have in years, every day in television. And such success stories of victory become news around the world. And we're used to seeing leaders in fatigues, army fatigues, giving such reports. And usually just the success stories are rewarded. So here we see Naaman in his prime, a successful Syrian army officer, I think that's interesting, from Syria, a commander, valued by the king and his country. He's a mighty warrior, and we can envision his chest full of medals, you know. That is how things work in our world, right? The successful get accolades. 
But the successful also try to cover up their weaknesses. Can you be fully transparent when you're in power? That's an interesting question. I mean, does anyone really want to have a leader who can at any moment in time be taken out of command by illness? Naaman was in such a dilemma. He was ever so powerful, but he had an illness which was slowly diminishing him. Leprosy or some other skin disorder was slowly moving through his body and every day he felt its debilitating effects. Incrementally, the pain increased. Not all at once, but slowly. And he could not let anyone know that he had it, for it was incurable. And I mean, an army officer, a big commander who had an illness, would be removed. As long as he could conceal his problem, all was relatively well. And this is, of course, so typical of all of us, isn't it? We like to cover things up. We're great at cover-ups. Don't let anybody know how we really are. I remember growing up, and my mother used to say something. There was something in the family going on, and she always said, don't tell anybody. And I was often like, huh? But it was like the family secrets had to be kept under wraps. Don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody how you really are. But Naaman can't cover up everything at home. And that is our story as well. How often we show our best face to the outside world. But we reveal the other side at home. Now here's a young girl in the story, and we don't know her name, but she is one of the captives that Naaman had taken in his victory in one of his battles in Israel. He took her back home with him, the spoils of war, this young girl. And she had been given to his wife to serve her. And this young girl, whose name we don't know, she's nameless, observed Naaman's problem within the family circle. He was uncovered at home, and she saw his illness. The young Jewish girl could have had ugly thoughts. She could have thought to herself, that serves him right. We're often like that, aren't we? Ready to judge someone, ready to say that very same thing, your problem is your own fault. But in this pandemic, I think we've been cured of some of this judgmentalism. For everyone has become vulnerable to getting COVID. And you can't blame anybody, really, for getting it. This young girl was selfless in sharing. Maybe she saw another side to this mighty warrior. Was he a kind man? A man who was uncomfortable in his own skin? even if he doesn't want to admit it. And we could talk about this if we sat in small groups. We could talk about this for a long time. Denying our real self has an effect on us. I have a friend who insists that her job was making her ill. And she has owned up to that reality and has quit her job. Jumping out to jump into unknown territory in the hopes to cure her own soul pain. Our story reveals that the young nameless servant girl said, I know where my master can get help. There is this prophet who can heal. She believed that this prophet was from God and could heal, and she passed her conviction of that possibility onto Naaman's wife, who then told Naaman. And Naaman was so desperate that he believes the girl. And he believes her words as true had he acts on it. He goes to the king, tells him what he has found out, and the king 
gives him permission to go and he says, here, I'll even give you a letter of introduction to the king of Israel. Obviously, a mighty warrior couldn't just cross over into territory he had raided before and done that without some kind of problem. So he gave him a letter of instruction and introduction. This powerful man, who is powerless to help himself, starts out. He has taken along valuable material goods to buy his healing. This is also typical of us, isn't it? We want to buy our way out of troubles. Name the price, and I'll pay it. And here Naaman feels in charge again. He's got this massive amount of silver and gold, and all this clothing that must have been elegantly uh, fixed up with jewels of different kinds. There's always a way to buy my way out of misery, right? Huh. Naaman reveals here a, a central question confronting us as well. Can we always buy our way out? I think we may, we may be learning today how limited this thinking is when we look at our world today. Can money alone eliminate the pandemic? Can money stop climate change? Can Putin be paid off in money alone to stop the war? We know that money can help solve many issues, but we realize as well our backs are against the wall. As a civilization, we just simply can't buy our way out. We'll get out of this and then go back to doing how we want to live, as we always have. So Naaman, if you can picture this, he arrives with his entourage. The king of Israel thinks he's in the wrong film. He is sure that this officer coming from Syria who attacked Israel before is setting him up for trouble. Like, if you can't help me, well then, I'll call in my army and we'll do some damage to Israel. He's in dismay. He rips his clothing. And then what happens? The real prophet intervenes. Send Naaman to me, the prophet tells the king, and he will learn that there is a true prophet in Israel. Imagine the scene. Naaman in full military gear, chariots and horsemen, and a huge amount of goodies for the prophet show up at Elijah's house. I wouldn't mind that, a visitor coming by with all those goodies. I think I'd let him in and say, well, yeah, what do you want? Sure, I can do it for you. Give me the goodies, and I'll give you what you want. Naaman is full of these feelings of entitlement, power, pride. He's ready to buy his cure. He's accustomed to people bowing and scraping before him. I mean, he's a man of power, and he must have been a massive, good-statured person. He's used to giving commands, and the underlings obey when he says something. This guy, although uncovered at home, and here because he is fragile, tries his best to put on a show of strength. Look who I am. Aren't we like that? We feel weak, we feel stupid, we sometimes feel just really not good, but when we go somewhere we try to puff ourselves up and we're, we're good. Have you ever been in those shoes? I think we all have if we're honest. To try to pretend we're more than we are is really quite a human fallacy. We think we're pretty good stuff, unless we're at home uncovered. It sounds familiar. And people try this with God as well. Here I am, God. Here's my issue. Fix it. And I'll give you some money. I'll pay my tithe for a while anyway. And then I'll be on my way. Is the prophet or God just a fix-it man? Elisha recognizes this arrogance, and therefore, this mighty man still has something to learn. I think we all have something to learn. It's always easy to let ourselves get in the way of our well-being. Pride and arrogance block our path 
to wholeness and even wellness. Naaman's learning curve begins with a social snub from the prophet. He doesn't come out to meet this mighty man. Imagine, here's Naaman, he shows up with his chariots, horses, entourage, gifts. He's sitting there, massive, expecting the prophet to come out, and he doesn't come out. Instead, he takes authority and commands Naaman through a messenger to go and dip down seven times in the Jordan River. And Naaman is furious. He's furious. The Jordan River is nothing like the rivers in Syria. He says, what is this? And in a rage, he's ready to leave, to get into his chariot and go home. Nobody is going to tell me what to do. Nobody is going to treat me like this. And in principle, the man had not been wronged at all. He was given the conditions for his cure. But he didn't like the path to wholeness. Think about that for a moment. How do we deal with God? We often tell him what we want and how he's to fulfill what we want. How do you fulfill my wishes, Lord? Here's my plan. And if God doesn't do it our way, we often get ready to pick up and go home and leave. Have you ever been like that or met people like that? They don't want the conditions God gives. They want to set their own conditions for God. And they're mad when God doesn't do it. Now here Naaman is convinced by his officers. Under him, they tell him, just do it. Just obey. And they seem to believe, go and wash and be cured. The most significant things and words in this entire story and in Naaman's learning curve are these words. So Naaman went down. He descended down the steep road to the Jordan Valley. He stripped down, he dipped down seven times which was required for priestly cleansing, and then he comes up, ascends clean. The spiritual reality is that going down allows us to finally go up. Going down finally allows us to go up. Richard Rohr wrote a book with the title, Falling Upward. There's no other way to wholeness. God's way is descending before ascending. Jesus came down to save us. Where are the places in your life which seem incurable? Where have you tried to buy your way out but found that it does not work? Where has pride kept you back from descending, going down? For only by going down can you go back up. Jesus gave his life for us, and then he ascended into glory. That is God's way. Falling upward. The paradox of those two words together is the clue. Naaman's story affirms truth. If you want to come up clean to full, healthy life, you first have to go down. Try it God's way, really. And you may be totally surprised. Naaman was. He didn't expect that. But he was fully restored. And he left a happy man. And all the people said, Amen. Amen.